Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he commanded the world, condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. 
By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around, marched around it for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all condemned for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Thank you, Jerry. Heavenly Father, we do pray for your wisdom and guidance and pray that the time spent in thinking about the message will be honored and that I feel it's to want to be shared. May your Holy Spirit touch the words, help us to realize why we're looking at these men of faith. In thy name we pray. Amen. The title probably doesn't really sound like men of faith, but Hebrews 11 is called the, sometimes called the uh, uh, heroes, heroes of faith chapter. Anyway, I remember as a young boy, on a warm summer day, I would put on a swimming suit and tie a towel around my neck and climb a tree and pretend to be a superhero. And I remember doing it, I would also slip on a cereal ring, you know, you used to get them in, the, as, in boxes of cereal, and pretend that I was Green Lantern. Unfortunately, I didn't stop to think that Green Lantern didn't wear a cape, but that didn't stop me. I would also sometimes pretend to be Superman. My cousin and I would play Batman and Robin in the uh, Hema, battling crooks and villains. And I also enjoyed Wonder Woman and Supergirl, but I didn't role play them because I didn't quite have the physical attributes to do those. Today we all have, we have all kinds of superheroes. Lately, every summer when I go back to the Midwest, my son Tracy, and his wife will take me to the latest X-Men, Spider-Man, or some other superhero movie. And I do enjoy them. So, did any of you have superheroes as a kid? Anybody? Lash LaRue. Lash LaRue, I was going to say. Maybe some of you had West... I remember Roy Rogers movies where he'd come right at the end with his crowd of, on horseback, you know, and all the kids in the movie theater would cheer because they knew that the heroes were on their uh, were riding to the rescue. Any others? Right. We're going to get to the biblical. 
But a lot of us, I know, I know, I, and I still enjoy them. But what is it that makes us want to imitate them? You know, if you remembered some from your past. I looked up uh, definitions, for, a definition for a hero. And the hero definition is a noun. A hero is a man or a woman of distinguished courage or ability, admired for his or her brave deeds and noble qualities. A hero is a person who, in the opinion of others, has heroic qualities or has performed a heroic act and is regarded as a model or ideal. Example, he or she was a local hero when he saved the drowning child. He or she did. Or it can be the principal male or female character in a story, play, or film. And from classical mythology, a being of godlike powers and beneficence who often came to be honored as a divinity. In the Homeric period, a warrior chieftain of special strength, courage, or ability. And later on, an immortal being such as a demigod. And in the more modern heroes, Thor would be an example of this. So what makes a hero? I still enjoy my superheroes, but strictly as a fan, I'm not a follower. I do have some heroes that I do follow. One of them is my dad. And I have shared some examples in my last sermon. He was firm but fair. He was forgiving. And here's an example some of you may have heard, some many have not. When I was in grade school, I mangled my left leg in a terrible tractor accident. And they were fearful for my life. And I remember dad visiting me and saying, I wish I could take your place. And by the way, two more heroes surfaced during that time in the form of two small town doctors that saved my life at my leg. And I think back to my future wife-to-be, who is now my present wife. When I was driving home after her graduation, she had the courage to ask me where I was spiritually. She confronted me by asking if I was saved. And I answered very ignorantly that, well, our church doesn't teach that we can know. Since then, I've discovered that the Lutheran church does not teach that. Let's move on to some even more important heroes, heroes of faith from Hebrews 11 that Jerry so adequately read to us. First hero, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable sacrifice to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. And although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example. The quality of, for the hero here is worship. To be a true hero of faith, we need to put God first. We must actively put into practice the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Abel didn't know that his brother was jealous. Question, did killing his brother help Cain in any way? Think of the inconsistency. And we do this all the time ourselves. Cain is mad at God for not accepting his offering, so he kills his brother. You know, somebody gets after you, so you take it out on the dog or the kids. And, uh, did that make God accept his offering? <laughs> there is a proper place for jealousy, but this is not it. Second hero. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. No one had ever seen rain before at this point. So by faith, Noah con condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So another hero quality is obedience. If we practice the faith God has given us, it requires obedience. I remember one time I really messed up for my dad. He gave me instructions to do something a certain way. But I knew better. I did it another way. It made what he had to do, which followed what I had done, much harder to do. 
when we disobey, even when we think we're following, thinking our way is better, God can still work things out. It may not be as good an outcome as his original plan. It's something more like damage control. And we have an admonition from 1 Samuel along this line. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. A third hero quality, and we go back to Noah again, where he built this large ark, and still on. The third quality is trust. Noah had no clue as to what God wanted him to do. He obeyed God. That obedience was based completely on trust. He trusted God implicitly. He went when God said go, and he stopped when God said stop. When it came time for Noah to build the ark, can you imagine the heckling that Noah might have received? Where are you going to say all that? There's no water around here. What's a flood? Consider the following. What would happen if Noah was building his ark in 2016? If Noah had to build an ark in 2016, his story may have gone something like this. And the Lord spoke to Noah and said, In one year I am going to make it rain, and the rain shall not stop until it submerges the entire earth and all living creatures are destroyed. Because of this, I want you to save the righteous people and two of every living species on earth. I want you to build an ark. And God gave the specifications for the ark. Daunted by this task, but respectful of God's wishes, Noah took the plans and agreed to build the ark. Remember, the Lord said, you must complete and fill the ark in one year's time. Well, exactly one year later, fierce storm clouds covered the earth and all the seas of the earth were in turmoil. The Lord saw that Noah was sitting in his front yard weeping. Noah, he shouted, where's the ark? Lord, please forgive me, Noah cried. I did my best, but there were big problems. First, I had to get a permit for construction. And your plans did not meet the building codes. I had to hire an engineering firm and redraw the plans. Then I got into a fight with OSHA over whether or not the ark needed a sprinkler system and approved flotation devices. Then my neighbor objected, claiming I was violating zoning ordinances by building the ark in my front yard. So I had to get a variance from the City Planning and Zoning Commission. Then I had problems getting enough wood for the ark because there was a ban on cutting trees to protect the spotted owl. I finally convinced the U.S. Forest Service that I really needed the wood to save the owls. However, the Fish and Wildlife Service wouldn't let me take the two owls. The carpenters formed a union and went on strike. I had to negotiate a settlement with the National Labor Relations Board before anyone could pick up a saw or hammer. Now I have 16 carpenters on the ark, but still no owls. When I started rounding up the other animals, an animal rights group sued me. They objected to me taking only two of each kind aboard. And this suit is still pending. Meanwhile, the EPA notified me that I could not complete the ark without filing an environmental impact statement on your proposed flood. They didn't take very kindly to the idea. Then the Army Corps of Engineers demanded a map of the proposed floodplain. <laughs> I sent them a globe. Right then I'm trying to res right now I'm trying to resolve a complaint filed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that I am practicing discrimination by not taking atheists aboard. The IRS has seized my assets claiming that I'm building the ark in preparation to flee the country to avoid paying the state some kind of user tax that I owe them and that I failed to register the ark as a recreational watercraft. And finally, the ACLU got the courts to issue an injunction against further construction of the ark, saying that since God is flooding the earth, it's a religious event and therefore unconstitutional. 
So God is like this. I really don't think I can finish the ark for another five or six years. I'm glad it wasn't 19, 2016. But who is the ultimate hero? Hero. The ultimate hero and cult involves these properties, qualities of our love and sacrifice. And when I told my wife the title of my sermon, Who is Your Hero? She looked at me, well, it's obvious. But is it? Jesus is the ultimate hero. We may say he is, but some people don't always practice what they preach. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. That was Hebrews 12, 2 through 5. I didn't have Jerry read that one. Okay, the ultimate hero is Jesus Christ. Superman can leap tall buildings in a single bound. Jesus can move mountains. Are there any mountains in your life? Financial? Marital? Sexual? Are there problems you're facing? Take them to Jesus. Get Christian spiritual counseling. Jesus' Holy Spirit can guide us through over or through or under these mountains of problems. And I'm not saying it's easy or a quick fix. It, I am saying that it can be long-term and a lasting solution. Consider this. You can be a truly spiritual hero. But to do this, we need to be more than a spectator. To be a hero, we need to be more than a fan. We need to commit to being a follower. A fan will switch sides which teams when his team is not doing well. But a follower will stay with him and encourage him and, and expect them to eventually come back. And are we ready to make that stand, our stand for Jesus? It just might force us to take up our cross rather than wearing it as a piece of jewelry. I finished reading a biography of Nabil Qureshi, Seeking Allah finding Jesus. Nabil was raised to be a very devout, peaceful Muslim. Living in the States, he became best friends with a Christian teen. They were in high school and college together. His Christian friend was very committed and knowledgeable about all the arguments against the Christian doctrine, such as the Trinity. Did Jesus really die or just appear to? Was he really resurrected? And so on. The Christian young man, with the aid of some leading apologist, that is, people who have studied these topics for 30 or 40 years, answered all these questions and arguments. Nabil became a, a convinced that the Christian doctrine was true and that Christianity was true. And by the way, it is possible to believe something totally, but if that belief is not acted on, it's the same as unbelief. Nabil was now faced with a very serious problem. If he made the choice for Christianity and shared with his family that he had become a Christian, his family's feelings would be hurt. They may disown him. He and his family may even be killed, murdered. Finally, he realized that it was not about him and his feelings, but it was about God. Was he willing to become a hero for God? Are we willing to be heroes for God? Look back over the examples just referred to. These were all ordinary people, no special training, no superpowers except the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. So be the best hero possible, the best father, mother, wife, husband, friend, and neighbor you can be. You can be a hero to somebody. Another quality in a hero is that he doesn't try to get even. He may defend or protect, but sometimes the most effective hero not only does not get even, but stays silent. Consider Matthew 26, 52. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. 
Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? And he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? So look at some final biblical examples that Jerry read for us. Others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed by the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All of these earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. These saints, including those sawed in two, were not tortured because they sat cloistered in a pew listening to a 10-minute sermon and singing 26 verses of Just As I Am. They were tortured because they left the church grounds and ventured into the public square, armed with their moral values and biblical beliefs. The way things are going in this world today, we may be headed for some of the same. Carl H. Henry says, The real heroes of our time are those who in a faithless age hold, live, and share their faith in God. Genuine, genuine revolutionary courage belongs to those who remain true to God, even if atheistic rulers force them underground or punish citizens simply for being a Christian. The true immortals will be those who seek to apply the principles of the Bible concretely to the complicated realities of modern life, who preserve a devout and virtuous family life, and who are faithful to the abiding values of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Are we ready to be that kind of hero? If not, we may be saying a new kind of prayer. The new school prayer. Think about this. Now I sit me down in school where praying is against the rule. For this great nation under God finds mention of him very odd. If scripture, now the class recites, it violates the Bill of Rights. And any time my head I bow, it becomes a federal matter now. Our hair can be purple or orange or green. That's no offense. It's the federal scene. The law is specific. The law is precise. Prayer spoken aloud is a serious vice. For praying in a public hall might offend someone who has no faith at all. In silence, we must meditate. God's name is prohibited by the state. Who are allowed to cuss and dress like freaks and pierce our noses, tongues, and cheeks? They've outlawed guns, but first the Bible. To quote the good book makes me liable. We can elect a pregnant senior queen and the unwed daddy as our senior king. It's inappropriate to teach right from wrong. We're taught that such judgments do not belong. We can get our condoms and birth control. Study witchcraft, vampires, and totem poles. But the Ten Commandments are not allowed. No word of God must reach this crowd. It's scary, I must confess, when chaos reigns, the school's a mess. So, Lord, this silent plea I make, if I be shot, my soul please take. And I forgot my one prop. You all seen the cap that I wear, and it says, uh, what is it, uh, CIA on it. And it spells out Christians in Action. I meant to have it up here to put it on and let you see it, but you have seen it. Well, in some schools, if I had that cap with me and wore it, I could be fired for wearing it. In some, in some places, I could be arrested, put in jail. And if you, I just heard a recent situation on a, a blurb briefly on a Christian station 
where this fellow was talking about in some colleges what the courses that you can take. And he says a new course had been added and it's one course, one college, and the course was called adultery. You can take a class on adultery now in some colleges. So, think about what I just read, the prayer, some of these examples, and we may be closer than we want to admit to a dictatorship or even to the great tribulation. But we realize that in Bonner's Ferry, we're pretty sheltered. We have a country, or a, sorry, county school superintendent who helped our ministerial association build a bridge between church and state to host a countywide Thanksgiving dinner using the school cafeteria. We can still sing true Christmas carols at Christmas. We can still say the Pledge of Allegiance, although there has been a little bit of opposition to that by some of the students at the high school and some of the teachers at the high school. I hope the ACL, I hope the ACLU that never gets winds of this, because if they do, it won't be long until the words of the poem that I just read will start to become true here. These conditions now exist in many schools in the country. A little girl was taken to the principal because she and her friend decided to pray for their meal out loud at the cafeteria. And she was taken to the principal's office and told that that was not legal, he couldn't do that. So keep in mind that schools are only one part of the equation. We may have to be heroes in other areas as well. Are we ready to be that kind of hero? One final thought. Heroes are not perfect. Look at some of the same ones mentioned. Abraham lied. Jacob cheated and stole. David murdered and committed adultery. Hosea married a prostitute. Yet God used these, each of these and more. <laughs> now I'm not advocating going out and murdering or committing adultery to be used of God. Just think of how much more easily you can be used without these hang-ups. Remember, Jesus was the only perfect hero. He is our role model and our ideal. With the Holy Spirit's power in our lives, we can continue to grow in him and have his mind he can still use us as heroes, even though we have imperfections. So, Superman can leap, may leap tall buildings in a single bound. Jesus created the materials for the building. Superman saves lives. Jesus saves souls. Superman catches criminals and puts them in prison. Jesus changes hearts and frees them from their internal prison. And let's pray. And Lord, we pray that and offer an invitation that maybe you, we need to rededicate our lives to the true one hero or maybe trust him for salvation and help us, Lord, to think about this as we pray. And the altar is open if someone wants, needs to follow through with any of these. Lord, guide our activities for the rest of this day. We thank you for these words help us to consider and think about them throughout the day. In thy name we pray. Amen.